Welcome to Al Bernstein Unplugged Unboxing. In a 40-year Hall of Fame career, Al has chronicled some of the greatest moments in boxing history. On this podcast, you get to hear him expand on those memories and talk about the current news in the sport of boxing. You also hear Al interview some of the biggest names in the sport. Here's Al Bernstein Unplugged. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the show. And on this one, we have such fun things to do. We got some great questions that you have sent us on Twitter at Al Bernstein. And we have a wonderful guest in Holt McCannelly, who is uh, a terrific actor. Uh, you know him as the star of uh, the Netflix series Mind Hunter. He's also been in many, many motion pictures, starred in his own uh, series called Lights Out on FX. And uh, in addition to all that, however, he is not only a huge boxing fan, he's a gentleman who trains in the sport all the time, even had an amateur fight, uh, and uh, has played a number of boxing roles, including playing Teddy Atlas in a movie, and also, uh, as I said, having that FX series called Lights Out, in which he played an aging heavyweight boxer. So Holt is very, very involved in the boxing world, and we're going to uh, chat with him about all of that. But first, let me bring in my co-host and partner on this show uh, at a time when he demonstrates his um, tremendous service to this show, doing the show while he's on his honeymoon. My good pal, Trip Mitchell. Trip, how you doing? I am doing great. And it is tough to talk your new wife into uh, letting her letting her stay out alone on the beach and me come up here but I'm looking forward to it. And Al, extending the use of the Al Bernstein corporate plane to come down here, that is amazing. Al, you, generosity knows no bounds with you. You know, I would not, I would not let everyone use the corporate plane, but in your case, Tripp, I, I, I made a special uh, dispensation. And, uh, um, you know, I mean, and some people complain because of the, the fact that it's kind of a vintage. I believe it was made in 1936. But it still flies. <laughs> we had to stop get up for, there. Yeah, you know, it reminds me of that scene from the movie Major League where they're taping the the wing before they go out and hold DC three. <laughs> but it's a it's a good one, Al. Thank it's you. A, it's a good. It's still a good uh, um, plane. Hey, I'm glad you're having a lot of fun down there, and uh, congratulations on finally getting away to your honeymoon. That's uh, that's a big deal, and we won't keep you too long. Okay, well, we've gotten some great questions this week, but first I wanna say some of my honeymoon reading is your book, and I'm enjoying it immeasurably, and it, it's oh, fun, it's a, it's a great read, and I think in a future episode, we're gonna take a look at some of your lists and get a chance for you to explain why, and there's some controversial things on these lists. I have a but, couple, uh, yeah, the book is called Al Bernstein, um, 30, uh, 30 Years, 30 Undeniable Truths About Boxing, TV, and Sports. And, um, and yeah, I, I, you know, I'm not a list maker by nature. So I devoted a whole chapter to list making because people always want you to make lists. You know, that's just the, the way of life. And so I did uh, put a couple together. And yeah, a few might be uh, a little controversial, but we don't normally associate major controversy with me, but uh, a few of them might be interesting. I'm glad you're enjoying the book. I really am, and the singing career and a lot of stuff, but controversies and lists, they go together in boxing, and they do. we'll start out with a question that's, you know, it's, it's very ethereal in one respect, but it's a great question. Who would you prefer in a fight, or who would you see winning? The 2002 version of Oscar De La Hoya versus the 2015 Canelo Alvarez. Yeah, that was a really a clever question because it's very specific and gives you a chance to zero in uh, on those two fighters at a specific time in their career. Now, in 2002, Oscar De La Hoya had, was fighting in the 154-pound division, so he was not a middleweight. Uh, he was still performing well, uh, fighting well, uh, starting toward the twilight of his career, the, the latter part of it but nonetheless was still a very good fighter. Now, the Canelo of 2015 that he would face was a Canelo that had just moved up to middleweight, although he wasn't really fighting middleweights. Like, he just fought uh, Miguel Cotto, and Miguel Cotto, of course, was better known as a welterweight and then uh, did go to 154 pounds. But so Canelo had just barely gotten to the middleweight ranks. Now, 
for Oscar De La Hoya, the middleweight division was not a great foray uh, for him. He ended up, of course, losing to Bernard Hopkins, uh, getting knocked out with that body shot. And the higher up Oscar went in weight, generally, it was he was less effective. For Canelo, on the other hand, going up to middleweight has benefited his, his career dramatically. And so even though that was Canelo in the early stages of his uh, middleweight career, and, and he still hadn't, I don't think, gotten to the place where he was the kind of dominant fighter he is today, because of his chin and because the middleweight limit does not suit Oscar De La Hoya, I'd probably have to pick Canelo. Okay. And uh, right now, where were Alvarez in the pound for pound category is top five? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, he has to be, right? Because he's, he's winning against very good competition for the most part and, and winning very well. You know, I mean, he's had some close fights, of course, but he's, he's a, just an excellent fighter. And, you know, he, he's a different fighter than he was uh, back, uh, you know, I mean, he started so young. By the time he fought Floyd Mayweather, he had already been a pro for six or seven years. And even then, many people thought he took that fight too soon, that if he'd fought Mayweather a couple years later, uh, you know, he would have done better. But uh, there's no question that um, right now, Canelo is one of the best fighters in boxing. Fantastic. And is a great draw because of, yeah. you know, when you have a Latin fighter, yeah, like and that. and and he's embroiled in the biggest lawsuit in the, in boxing. <laughs> <laughs> he, you know, if you're going to sue someone, go big or go home. Well, you know, it's yeah, it's uh, how that shakes itself out is going to have a lot of implications for the sport in general. We'll see. Well, we early on in the podcast, you had Bob Arum on, and he pointed out the fact that because these fights are coming back without a crowd, the fighters are going to have to make less money. Yeah. And that's a dynamic. <laughs> okay. We've got a question from Aussie who loves the show. Jason Mayhem Maloney versus the Monster Inouye coming up on Halloween. What do you think of that fight? Yeah. Uh, Inouye, of course, is a fantastic uh, uh, fighter from Japan uh, who uh, just had a great fight um, uh, with Nonito Donaire. Uh, in which he was tested by Donaire more than I think people anticipated. But Inoue is a, a big knockout puncher uh, in the super bantamweight division. And the, the, uh, Maloney is a, he is a really good fighter. He and his brother, both excellent fighters. And I believe that this fight is going to come down to whether Jason can get on the inside uh, against Inoue and really battle away uh, for short range because that way the big power uh, of uh, the Japanese superstar will be nullified a little bit. Uh, if you're at arm's distance against Inoue, you're going to just, you're going to get blasted. Um, and I think if he can get on the inside, I think he can make this a really good fight. Of course, he's the underdog against Inoue, but, but anything can happen. And I do believe that fight has fight of the year written all over it. Fantastic. And you mentioned Anito Donaire. Eight, nine years ago, he looked like he had the brightest future in boxing. Uh, does he still have a chance? Does he have a great future? Or well, he, what do you you think? Know, he's older now. And, he, and, of course, he's had a great career. And he resurrected it in the last couple of years. Uh, and that performance against Inouye was, was, was well, phenomenal. Uh, and we will see him on Showtime Boxing uh, in December uh, in, uh, in, in a match against Ubali. Uh, and, and that should be a great fight. So um, Nonito Donaire knows that he's in the twilight of his career, but he has kind of reinvented himself. Fantastic. And always an amazingly hardworking fighter. Yeah. And then next question, what is the favorite undercard during your broadcasting career that you've called? And then we'll transition for the second part of that question the proudest moment you've had singing a song up on stage and what makes you feel the most proud. So. Ah, okay. Well, let's deal with the boxing part first. Um, the, I picked a, a fight that was in May, on May 7th of 2011. It was on the undercard of the Shane Mosley, Manny Pacquiao pay-per-view that we were doing. And it was Wilfredo Vasquez Jr. against Jorge Arce. Vasquez Jr. was the younger of the fighters and, uh, 
Arce was already starting to hit the end of his career, but was still a very, very good fighter. Uh, and they got together and created a wild 12 round fight. It was action back and forth. Uh, and, I, and I personally thought the fight was razor thin. We got into the 12th round and Arce hurt Vasquez Jr and kept him pinned against the ropes for what seemed like an eternity. Joe Cortez, the referee, did not stop the fight, and I think rightfully so in, in many respects because uh, he was, you know, defending himself and it didn't look like it, there was going to be, uh, you know, like there was an imminent stoppage. But uh, Wilfredo Vasquez Jr.'s father, Vasquez Sr., who was himself a great, great champion, he was working in his son's corner, he threw the towel in. And uh, it was a very controversial and kind of, uh, you know, interesting moment because no one knew what the scorecards had on them. And some thought that his dad had acted precipitously. Others thought, rightfully, it was uh, you're protecting your fighter and especially you're protecting your son. Uh, and when they looked at the score, so of course Arce won the fight. When they looked at the scorecards, two of the judges had to draw at 104. And one judge, mysteriously, as is often the case, had it 107, 102 for Arce. So, <laughs> so had uh, he allowed his son to continue, he still would have lost the decision because he would have lost that last round. Uh, and the two other, the two draw scorecards would have ended up being in favor of Arce. But uh, it was a great, great fight. And, uh, and I think to this day, it's probably the best one I've seen on an undercard. And then before we get to the song real quick, in a future show, another thing, it'd be fun to talk about great father and son combinations. Oh, the father's the trainer. Idea. And this, it's an interesting dynamic there, isn't it? I like that one. Yeah, keep that one in your hat. Uh, because um, we should do that. And uh, you know what we should do? I'll have, uh, uh, maybe I'll, we'll interview a couple of uh, fathers that train their sons and, uh, and then we can discuss it as well. I like that idea. And then you can get Wes ready for his next fight. He's in the music business. <laughs> if he yeah. knows how to fight, he will be the one artist treated properly by the record company and the that promoters. That is true. Yeah, my son who is a singer songwriter is, uh, has, never take, has never exactly taken up uh, Boxing. In fact, we were joking. He and I were joking a little bit because he's not big on the the uh, the uh, sports with balls in him either. But, but when he was younger, he played a little basketball. And I was, we were talking, and I said, "Yo, that's the sport. If you were going to take up the sport, that would have been the one you would have been good at." And he agreed. Uh, but uh, luckily, uh, I, I'm so into music that I'm thrilled that he's in that. Fantastic. Now, what what song have you done that you were the most proud of? Because you're covering some amazing stuff. And in one case, in front of the actual uh, writers from uh, New York and, and Broadway. Yeah, I told this story, and I'll, I'll tell an abbreviated version. Don Dunphy brought Frederick Lowe, the, who wrote the lyrics for uh, My Fair Lady and Camelot and all those great uh, uh, musicals. He brought him to one of my shows, and I had to sing a Lerner and Lowe song in front of him. That was daunting. Um, you know, it actually isn't exactly a song. Um, Probably the moment I was, and the, and the writer was alluding to what was, you know, a hard moment where you feel like you mastered something. And for me, the, the one thing that I don't do, one of the things that I don't do as, a, as a, a, a musical performer is, I'm not a jazz singer. I'm not a, I do the Amer Great American Songbook, but I'm not somebody that uh, is going to bend the melody uh, as much as others. I'm certainly not a scat singer. And so when we get into that territory, it's not my bailiwick. Well, I was in about 15, 20 years ago, I was in LA and uh, I had just done a show uh, out in LA and we went a couple nights before, we went to this uh, jazz club where a gentleman was performing. I can't remember his name. He was a local LA artist and he was a big boxing fan. And he had introduced me earlier in the show. And then he got to the point where, as often happens, right, he, he was, and he was more of a jazz artist for sure. Uh, he, he, he was up there and he had brought up a, a couple friends who were also singers that, out of the audience. 
and they had launched into, I think the song was How High the Moon, and it e devolved or evolved into a scat session where they're doing some of the, the, the song and they're scatting and, uh, and of course that is like kryptonite to me, right? Um, so of course, he, he gets all excited and said, and, and Al Bernstein, we just saw him two nights ago, you know, at the, wherever I performed, he said, let's get him up here and have him join in, right? And I, there was no way for me to say no to this, right? So I didn't know what to do. So I jumped up and I, I tried to remember the advice that was given to me by the great Clint Holmes, who is, uh, does every kind of music imaginable and is very good at, uh, uh, as a true jazz singer as well. He said, you know, he said, one of the, the, one of the tricks for people that don't scat uh, to look like they can scat, he said, there's a couple of tricks. One, find a, a, a repeated uh, version of it that you can repeat two or three times as things go on that you already have memorized in your head so you're not letting the music take you there. And he said, and less is more. And if you follow those two bromides, he said, this is the way he put it to me. He said, if you follow those two bromides, you might get through. So that was really, <laughs> gave me a lot of confidence. He said that to me <laughs> about 20 years ago. Well, this was that situation come to life. Well, I got up there and these were three, these guys were monsters. They were amazing performers. And I followed his, his lead and I, I did exactly what he said and, and I, I, it, I got through by the skin of my teeth, which I was thrilled about because it was one of those really great scenes of a nightclub in LA and, and you didn't, and, and I lay, and then I, how about this? I find out because he came up to me, the jazz critic from the LA Times was in the room. Wow. So he, he comes up and he, he ended up being a boxing fan and he came up, he said, you know, he said, that was, uh, he said, uh, that was nice. He said, I didn't get to see you when you performed. He said, but uh, he said, I didn't know you were a jazz guy. <laughs> and I said, I said, well, you know, I dabble. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> totally fooled him. So that was my, that was my biggest accomplishment. Well, fantastic. And it was funny in your book said you almost had a chance to work with Frank Sinatra and going way back where he was a big well, Yeah, he was going to be a, a, on a broadcast uh, because he was going to do the, yeah, exactly. They were, had him ticketed to be on a broadcast, like doing something, whether he was roving or whatever, for a Ray Mancini fight. And then that fell through. Uh, and then it, you know, it wasn't the case. And uh, so that was going to be a lot of fun. But uh, he, because, you know, a lot, back in those days, I mean, Burt Lancaster did the color commentary on uh, one of the Ali fights, Ali well, Frazier, I, I think it was, you know, they, they mixed and matched in a way that uh, was, you know, kind of unique. Okay. And our finally, final question, when Jerry Farrell asked this question, when did you feel accepted as a color analyst in the sport after you started? And the second part of the question, which is interesting because most sportscasters have this happen, were you ever denigrated and made to feel like you couldn't call by someone because you didn't have a long professional career, though you did fight amateur yeah. for many years in Chicago. Yeah, you know, that is a great question. And uh, first, I, I came in with a, uh, when I was, you know, got on board, I wasn't known certainly to the boxing community. Uh, I was a writer, a boxing writer, but I was, I didn't have a huge reputation. I, uh, so I wasn't known in that regard either. And I certainly wasn't an ex champion of any kind. And so I made up my mind that the approach I was going to take was one of being informational and adding in uh, analysis of the fight. I wasn't going to hang my hat on just analyzing the fight because why should these people trust me? So I did everything I could to integrate informational items in to add something to the, to the broadcast. And then I thought if I analyze the fight correctly, they'll appreciate it and I will get through and then I will gain respect. That's really pretty much the way it played out for me. Um, and I think there, I, I'm gonna say that three or four years in, uh, I felt very much the, um, 
you know, the, the acceptance of, uh, of, of virtually most of the boxing people. Now, some people still, uh, you know, you'll have your snarky guy on Twitter and say, hey, you didn't even fight. How do you know? Well, of course, as you pointed out, I did have a bunch of amateur fights. Uh, the only thing I can say about that, and, and the reason most people probably don't know it is because I don't talk about it very much because it wasn't a, a revered amateur career. I didn't win a a gold medal. I didn't win a national title, uh, but I had maybe 30, 40 amateur fights that at least instructs me in how, bo how difficult boxing is and what it's like when you get in the ring. But, uh, but I, I, the, the boxing community was very warm to me in, in accepting me. And I worked very hard at, at kind of gaining that acceptance, you know, as I went. So uh, anyway, that now, we have a, a terrific guest with us on this show, um, um, Hope, Holt McCannelly is, as I mentioned earlier, a wonderfully talented man. And there's something else you're going to find in this interview. And, and Tripp, I think you'll agree with this. He is one of the most insightful and uh, kind of analytical guys that you're going to bump into, right? Oh my gosh, he is so smart. And I looked after the interview, I wanted to read more about him and his education over in Europe. I mean, this guy is an eclectic yeah. Renaissance man who also looks like a heavyweight. Well, you know, I'm sure he's gonna be the only guest we, will, we have had to this point and maybe ever who studied at the Sorbonne. So I'm pretty sure well, he's gonna keep, keep that one. Yeah, yeah. so anyway, here is, our, here is our chat that we had uh, with Holt McCannelly. Holt, uh, first of all, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you uh, taking the time to do this. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure, Al. As I said to you, you know, uh, uh, in the past, I, I've been a fan for a long time. So it's very nice to be with you. Well, th this is great. And um, one of the reasons we w I wanted to have you on, of course, this show is very boxing oriented. Uh, and while we are going to talk about uh, your career from an artistic standpoint, I want to talk about your love of boxing and your involvement with the sport, which has been really remarkable. You actually learned to box as a, as a young man and continued to do it really your whole life, haven't you? Well, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, I love it. I wish, you know, I wish I had more time to do it, you know, at, right at this stage in my life. You know, um, uh, the pandemic would have been perfect for me if the gyms somehow stayed open. Do you know what yeah. I mean? But they also, not only did I not have a shooting schedule, but then they closed the gyms. But I, I, uh, um, I've been training uh, uh, recently with a, a very good undefeated uh, welterweight named Brian Ceballo. Mm. And uh, uh, Brian, uh, I've been working with Brian and that's been, uh, that's been going well. And, and, you know, and previously, uh, uh, you know, I got to work with the great uh, Mark Breland. Yeah. Um, you know, and, uh, and, 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 and even the legend, you know, Teddy Atlas, uh, I was, uh, I was in the gym with Teddy when I was, uh, for, for when I was doing the pilot for, uh, for Lights Out, a television show I did where I played a, play, played a yes. fighter. And, you know, so, um, uh, yeah, my brother won the, won the Golden Gloves, you know, when we were kids. And um, I used to pick on my little brother, but once he won the gloves, it became, do you know what I mean? It became yeah. dice. So I, I figured, you know, I better I better try to step up my game a little bit. Um, but no, you know, look, it, it's a it's a very exciting it's a very exciting sport, and uh, I've been a fan since I was a boy. So uh, it's been wonderful for me, you know, to be able to be around boxing and to be in a few films and and, and television shows that were boxing related, and to have a lot of friends in the boxing community. Yeah, you do indeed. And let's talk about the, 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 how boxing has intersected with your uh, professional career. You mentioned Teddy Atlas. You played Teddy Atlas. You played him in the movie about Mike Tyson. Um, and uh, that's where you guys got to be friends. How did he help you prepare to play him? <laughs> Oh, look, look, you know, um, uh, you know, his input was crucially important. And, you know, I think part of the reasons, part of the reason that we've been friends uh, for nearly 30 years now wow. is, uh, is because, um, uh, you know, of that initial interaction. You know, what happened was, it's an interesting story, Al. Um, I, got a, I got a call from a, from a casting director uh, that I really like named Natalie Hart. And she was gonna she was gonna cast this movie for HBO about Mike Tyson, and 
she called me up and she said, hey, would you like to play Kevin Rooney? And I was <laughs> like, um, I don't think I can play. Have you seen Kevin Rooney, Natalie? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I don't really, I don't really look like, like Kevin Rooney. I said, but you know who I could play maybe is Teddy Atlas. Would they let me audition to be Teddy Atlas? And she said, but Teddy Atlas is only going to be one scene in the movie. I said, that's all right. So I'll be in the movie for one scene. I was a young actor. You know, I'm not, I'm not you know, if it's a good project and I like the character, it was not the time in my life yeah. or, or my career. Do you know what I mean? It was, yeah. it was much bigger. But it turned into a much bigger part because of Teddy's input. Because the first thing he said, I called him. I said, look, Mr. Atlas, I'm an actor. I'm going to play you in a film. Um, I'd like to meet with you. At the time, uh, it was an exciting time, actually, to be around Teddy Atlas, because he had two great heavyweights. He had Michael Moore. Right. Uh, this is 1993, right? So Moore fights uh, for the title and beats Holyfield in April of 94. So at the time, Teddy invited me. My first meeting with him, you know, he said, come to the House of Pain. It was a gym in New Jersey, uh, I think West Orange, New Jersey, where he was training at that time, you know, Shannon and Michael. Right. And uh, so I got to be, so right away, you step in, and you're on the top echelon of the sport. Right. Do, do you know what I mean? Michael, you know, was heavyweight champion of the sure. world just a few months later. Do, do, do you know what I mean? You know, um, and, heady stuff. Uh, yeah, heady stuff. I, for for me, it certainly was. You know, and then also, you know, you know, Teddy, you know, took the time to explain to me a little bit more about the dynamic between um, him and Mike Tyson between him and Customato, between Mike Tyson and Customato, and what the circumstances were in Catskill during that period. And as Tyson started to grow in importance and, you know, um, you know, was acting out, do, do, do you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, you know, you know, volumes have been written, do, do you know what I mean? About, <laughs> you know, about, about, about that whole thing. But you see, you know, and although I knew some of it, I didn't know all of it, and I didn't have a nuanced understanding of it, and 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 so so he gave me that, and I shared that with the director when I got to believe it or not, it's a film that takes place in Catskill, New York, but we shot it in Los Angeles, California, and uh, you know, Go figure. Um, right, and uh, 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 and 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 immediately the part grew, as soon as I said to the director, um, a German director named Uli Edel, who also did uh, Last Exit to Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Right, if, I'm, if, yeah. I, if I if I remember correctly, so 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 I, I started telling him, you know, about my conversations with Teddy, and then the writer came over, and then the scenes started to grow, and then the famous confrontation between Teddy, you know, yeah. and, and 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 Michael, and all that stuff, and it became a much bigger part. And one of the things that was really great for me also about that show was, um, in the role of Customato, um, was uh, the legendary actor George C. Scott. Oh. And it just so right, and it just so happens that George's uh, eldest son Matthew was an old and dear friend of mine, and and when my father uh, won a Tony Award on Broadway as a producer for the first Irish play, my father was Irish to win uh, top honors on Broadway. Uh, George C. Scott presented him with the award, wow. so I had this sort of connection, <laughs> George, and then the whole thing that went down, you know, with the, all the, the, the you know, you know everything. Amazing. That happened with Teddy, and uh, so it was a it was a successful shoot for me, and um and it led to a lot of other possibilities. As a matter of fact, Al, you know, I mean, you know, we're actually we're actually developing a project that's based around uh, around Teddy's life. You know, all of these you know years later, it well be it's it's been a long time in gestation. He's got a very interesting history. I'm sure you know all about it. He's sure. a very well known guy. You know, in boxing, and uh, uh, so. Um, you know, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about doing an eight part limited series that would cover all of that territory. Do you know what I mean? From, you know, the early portion of his life, the time in Catskill with Custom Auto, with Mike wow. Tyson, coming down to New York, being a trainer in Gleason's gym, you know, working with guys like uh, Johnny Vitarosa and uh, Chris Reed and Donnie Lalonde. Do you know what I mean? All of that stuff, you know, and all the way, you know, to, um, to, uh, to Moorer. 
and well, that the, that the, would the, be yeah. that would be fascinating for sure. Um, that, that, uh, and that role um, the, was not the last one you would play, of course, in, in boxing. And one role that you're, uh, you're very well known for is your role in Lights Out, the FX series, uh, in which you played an aging heavyweight. Uh, and of course, your affinity for boxing and the fact that you do it helped you a lot. Um, and you, you had some interesting comments I saw about doing fight scenes and how you feel how they need to be really meticulously um, choreographed to make sure they're effective and safe. And, well, absolutely, you know, um, but you want them to be exciting. Yeah. Right? I mean, that was an old custom autoism, right? It's like, yeah, you know, you want to be a good fighter, but you also want to be exciting. Yeah. Do you, do you know what I mean? So, so, so you try to choreograph, you know, you know fights um, uh, from that perspective and you borrow from famous fights, you know, uh, uh, and, uh, and great fighters and great moments in, in fights. Yeah, and, uh, and did you think when you were playing that role, did you think of any actual boxers that uh, informed you on, on, on this character? Or was he so uh, uniquely different that there wasn't anyone to even uh, Well, no, no, no. I mean, you know, it's funny. Uh, my friend Teddy once... <laughs> Once said to me uh, that my boxing style, such as it, such as it is, um, <laughs> and there's let's just say a lot of room for improvement. <laughs> um, but um, there was a um, an Australian uh, light heavyweight champion named Jeff Harding. Yes, I don't know if you remember Jeff Harding. I do remember him. You know what I mean? He, you know, he was an exciting guy to watch. Later on in his life, he had some personal problems. You, you know what I mean? But um, but uh, but I believe he's a two time light heavyweight champion of the world, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So, so that's an impressive accomplishment. You know, uh, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, um, you know, I watched all, all the, all the old Irish guys, the, you know what I mean? The Jerry yeah. fights, you know what I mean? You know, I, I've, I watched all of my friend Jerry Cooney's fights, you know, um, you know, and uh, I was training in the gym uh, with a, with a, with, with, I shared a trainer at one time with uh, John Duddy, the dairy oh, another great Irish fighter. Yeah, <laughs> terrific. Another great Irish fighter. You had, and, you had some people to look at, that's for sure. I had some people to look at, but also remember, you know, you know, the kind of people that, that I had advising me and coaching me. I'm talking about guys like Mark Breland, who, you know, uh, is a, an Olympic gold medalist and uh, widely considered the greatest amateur fighter of all time, a two-time champion of the world, you know, and, uh, you know, he went on from training me. His, his, next, his next fighter was Deontay Wilder. So it's a little bit of a step mm. off. You know I, I, like, <laughs> I like to feel that it wasn't that big a movement up. Hold. I, I, you know, I, you know, I, yeah, you know, you're, 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 you know, <laughs> you know, you know. Uh, it's nice of you. It's nice of you to say, it, but no, uh, uh, but no, but they got, got, you know, they gave me, they gave me their time, and yeah, that's the great. Benefit, and the, you know, and their, and their wisdom, and I tried to soak up as much as I could. And you also actually had a an amateur bout in which you I did, yeah. Uh, well, you, you, the USA Amateur has a senior division. My friend Mario Lopez has done that. And mm -hmm. you, uh, in fact, did that. That had to be a grand experience. I was going to do that. Uh, you know, I boxed amateur many, many years ago, and I was going to do that. I never got around to it, but I'm glad you did. Well, look, you know, I, I'd like to do it again. You know, Bruce Silverglade, uh, who owns Gleason's Gym, uh, has a charity called Give a Kid a Dream. You know what I mean? And, and he works with, you know, you know, you know, some, some of them are terminally ill kids and you know what I mean? And, and, and kids that are very, you know, and so, and so part of the proceeds was, was to benefit, you know, that organization. And also it was fun for me, you know, if you hang around a boxing gym long <laughs> enough and you go in there every day, it's only a question of time before one of the trainers turns to you and says, you know, I think you're ready for an amateur fight. <laughs> and then, exactly. you know, you've been sparring. And look, you know, I had the benefit uh, on a certain level of, um, of, spar of, the, of sparring guys who were a lot younger than me because that's who was there. Do you know what I mean? There, was, there wasn't right. a lot of guys. My, that's who was there. So you're always in there with guys that are a little faster. Do you know what I mean? Guys that are, you know, you know have, and, and, uh, and so – so when I when I finally when I finally got in the ring, you know, and I asked Bruce Silverglade, it's so funny, uh, Al. I said, "Can I ask one favor, Bruce? Could I be first up? Could my fight? Because you you know, yeah. I just didn't want to wait around in the locker room, you know, and right. you know what I mean? Because you know, look, I, I read a, a fascinating quote recently with Sugar Ray Robinson, 
And he said, if, 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 if you don't feel fear before you go into a fight, then you should find something else to do. Mm -hmm. do, do, do you know what I mean? Because no. that's there for a reason, right? You, do, you know, that's, that was Sugar Ray, Sugar Ray Robinson. So, you know, um, you know uh, anyway, so I asked Bruce to put me first, and he put me dead last out of 19, <laughs> dead last out of 19 fights. So for 19 fights, I sit around, I sit around, but that's all right. And so then I got in there, and, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, I was and still am a, a kind of one-dimensional, so I, I, I wanted to be moving forward. Do, do, do you know what I mean? And, you know, um, uh, uh, and, and, you know, and also you never really know how big a puncher a guy is until right. you're do – you, do you see what I mean? And, and it varies wildly, and even among sparring partners. Do you know what I mean? It, you know, it, it, it varies. So what I, what I, what I discovered in the 30, first, like, 30 seconds of the bout – was that my opponent was comfortable going back. That, that, that actually, you know, was sort of, I mean, but I was able to move him back. And, uh, and also, when, when, he, when he hit me, you know, it was, it was not as hard as many of the sparring partners that I had trained with at Gleason's gym prior to the match. Do you see what I mean? So all of a sudden, um, you know, I became relaxed i wasn't i you know but, you know but you're still very alert sure. and then you know and then you know three rounds it's a, only a three round fight but you know your your adrenaline is pumping you know and and when when it's your first few fights i think there's a tendency you know you know you you, you want to you, you can get tired even after three rounds That's i know right. it doesn't and i was in really good shape and i didn't i didn't get tired mm -hmm. but you know i you know and i won the fight but um but uh you know, I was very glad that I had trained as much as I had. Absolutely. He was good, you know, my the, the amateur boxing people have a misnomer. I remember many, many years ago when I had my 30 or 40 amateur fights, I, no matter how good shape I was in, the, that nervousness and that, uh, that anxiety literally takes energy away from you a little bit. So even a three-round fight can test your durability. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm, that was a, uh, it sounds like a grand experience and I'm, I'm glad that you, that you had it. Well, thank you very much, Al. Yeah, it was, I enjoyed it. I may do it again. Holt, very few actors that I can think of have had as diverse roles as you have. Um, in your long career, uh, you have literally played a wide breadth of characters. Is part of that by design to challenge yourself as an actor? Yeah, well, you know, you know, it's funny, you know, um, you, you, you read a script out and, you know, you know, you have to, you have to be honest with yourself about whether or not you feel a connection to a particular, mm -hmm. do I see right for this part? Do I feel right? Do I, when I read this guy, you know, do I see parts of myself in him? Do, you, you know what I mean? Because, you know, you, the, the character is always going to be born out of, uh, of you. Do, you. do you know what I mean? You know, Orson Welles, right. you know, used to say, do you know what I mean? Some, you, you, some you, part of it's organic, even if it's not you. Well, you, you remove the parts about yourself that don't correspond to the oh, character right. that you wish to create, and what will remain is the character. Mm -hmm. So it's always in here. You're never searching for it out there. But that doesn't mean that you can't play the characters that are very different to yourself because of the way they allow themselves to experience things that are already, you know. So, um, so yeah, you know, I... Uh, uh, I was attracted to different kinds of parts, and um, and so I've had uh, I've had the opportunity, um, you know, to 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 play a wide variety of roles, and and that's part of what keeps the job so fun and uh, and and interesting. Yeah, I, I would imagine. And in the last few years, you have played uh, a character that you talked about how you play characters that don't necessarily embody everything about you. Well, you are a very fit man who, as we've talked about, likes to box and train. And yet, in the last couple of years, you have gained a lot of acclaim playing a, an overweight, chain-smoking a uh, detective <laughs> on Mindhunter. Right. So that really, in addition to embodying a different character, you had to feel different physically to do it. Well, you know, you know, you have to, you make a determination, you know, about what, you know, who this guy would be, to who you feel he, he is, you know, um, 
you know, when I when I when I played Patrick when I played Lights Leary, you know, on FX, you know, um, you know, he he's a former champion. And 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 even though you do see former champions sometimes mm -hmm. who do get very heavy or out of shape or when they stop training, you do see that. But you know, you 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 also see examples of guys, you know, who who try to keep themselves, you know what I mean, trim and stuff. But with uh, with Mind Hunter, I just didn't I didn't feel that way, Al. You know, he's a uh, he's a, as you said, you know, a, a chain smoking, hard drinking, yeah. uh, uh, you know, FBI detective in the seventies. You know, um, who spends most of the time on the road and eats nothing but you know you know bad food and right. uh, and his only exercise is an occasional round of golf. So so it didn't seem to me that he that that character needed to be you know um you know in great shape it's something they could no, yeah but then you got to be able to drop it or, or you right. know i'm, I'm like yeah. right now as i'm speaking to you i would say right now i'm about i'm about i'm about 205 so i'm like 25 pounds lighter you know what i mean than sure. than i was on the show and it could be it could be more than 25 to be honest. yeah no that's amazing you uh in season number two of mine hunter you got to explore uh Bill's character uh, a little bit more, which I, I've seen you talk about how gratifying that is and how happy you are that David Fincher and the writers let you do that. Not all cop shows allow you to examine the characters, do they? No, no, they, 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 they really don't. Um, you know, and it's funny, you know, um, that's part of the really exciting thing about television when it's really good is that there's more real estate out, you know, you know, we had, we had two seasons of Mindhunter, you know, we had, uh, we had 19 episodes of Mindhunter. That's a lot of, that's a lot of time to develop yeah. a character. There isn't enough I I time in a, in a, in a two hour movie or a three hour play mm -hmm. to, to, to really explore in that kind of detail, the types of things that we got into. So yeah, I was, uh, I was very lucky to be, um, in in such a in such a great show, um, this show was was critically acclaimed, you know, all over the world, and um, um, you know, it was it was one of the best experiences of my life. But you know, I don't smoke. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Even though I smoke constantly, you know, on the television show, and people will say, "Well, are they phony cigarettes?" No, they're real cigarettes because oh. the the organic ones they don't burn the same on film. They don't look the yeah. same. And you know, well, are you really smoking? And I'm like, yeah, you. The camera is right here. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So yes, you're smoking. And you know, uh, uh, our director David Fincher is someone who is known for doing a lot of coverage yeah. and a lot of takes. So it's not just a question of smoking for a few minutes and then you're moving on to the next scene. We may spend two days in one scene or three. Yeah. To, to, right. So, and you're yeah. gonna. And once something is set in rehearsal, you know, for the editor, you don't want to make. Do you, do you know what I mean? It's been. It's been. Yeah, the, the, yes, a, 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 a scene can continue to grow and you find things, but generally speaking, if if I took a a big drag of the cigarette before I said something to Charles Manson, they're gonna want me to do that mm -hmm. on subsequent takes. So the you have to you learn as time goes on. <laughs> You know what I mean? To be a little bit judicious, because sometimes I would be dizzy. Do you know what I mean? Like nauseous where from uh, from the smoking. So yeah, but just, I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's that's crazy. Now you spoke. You're speaking about Mine Hunter in the past tense. It would be a malpractice of me to sit here and interview you and I, not ask whether you think uh, that Mine Hunter could ever return in some fashion. Well, you know, Al, I mean, look, um, I really think that if Mindhunter does not return, it's, it's a shame because um, it's not easy to make a show that, um, that people really, really respond to the way they no. responded to Mindhunter. It's it's not an easy thing to do, and if it were easy, more people would do it. Yeah. Do you know right. what I mean, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, people really like the show um so my hope is uh that uh, that it will return at, at some point but you know um uh it's a decision it's a decision for netflix obviously and for my friend david fincher 
and um, you know, uh, I just, I just, you know, need to, you know, remain, you know, available if I can. Do you yeah. see? Because it, because if I if I sign on to another show and it's a, sure. a multi year deal, then I wouldn't even be free to do the thing if they called. You know what I mean? So right. so you know, it would need to happen soonish. I think realistically, yeah. yeah. Well, even just the hope will make uh, all the Mine Hunter fans feel a little bit better. <laughs> you, uh, your, your co-star in uh, Mine Hunter, Jonathan Graf, uh, shares in common with you and your great mother, um, <clears throat> Julie Wilson. Julie Wilson, who yeah. was uh, a wonderful, wonderful actress, uh, Tony nominee, and yes. uh, also a, the, the best cabaret performer, perhaps, of all time. I was a big oh, fan of hers. Well. Thank yeah, you. Lovely. Thank you. you know, so uh, that, that you know, it was extraordinary. And Jonathan Graff, who plays your partner in this very serious um, mm -hmm. uh, police um, story, mm -hmm. is a Tony-nominated musical comedy performer. And yet you two... Um, have bonded so well. And I'm wondering if even part of that experience with your mom makes you kind of gravitate to him and the fact that you are a music uh, lover as well. Uh, you know, that's such an interesting question, Al. I promise you, nobody has ever asked me anything like that. It fasc it's a fascinating question. Um, you know, uh, yeah, my mother was a nightclub singer and a Broadway actress. And um, and Jonathan um, is, uh, uh, is, is, a, is a wonderful wonderful singer and in a, 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 and a very accomplished Broadway actor. Um, um, his last show, Hamilton, do you know what I mean? Was a pretty big hit. I think I heard um, of that. You know, and uh, he of course was nominated for a Tony Award for King George, it, it, you know, which he's brilliant in the thing. You know, um, he was nominated for uh, Sp Spring's Awakening, um, his first show. Um, I think that's what it is. So, so, so he's, um, you know, he's, He's definitely from that world, and and you know the the the, the, the those kinds of very dark, very gritty uh, police dramas. It it was it was in some ways new territory, uh, mm -hmm. for Jonathan. Yes. Um. But you know he's he's such a gifted actor. Um. That there's there's nothing you can really throw at Jonathan. You know what I mean? That he can't handle. Right. And um, um, and we kind of hit it off um almost from the start. You know, at the end of my mother's life, my mother, uh, you know, uh, uh, thank you for, for saying that, Al, was a, was a well-known nightclub singer in New York City, uh, you know, and uh, um, they did a memorial for her. And uh, I, what I discovered, Al, was that at the end of my mother's life, I realized that nothing gave her more pleasure than when I would get up and sing one of her old songs. And you're a very so good daughter, singer, by the way. Well, thank you. Anyway, I'm not Jonathan is the singer. But anyway, so 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 Jonathan and I did a duet um, at my mom's uh, memorial. Um, we sang That's Life, the famous Sinatra song. And uh, and Jonathan uh, uh, forgot his words, but that's OK. Yes. Because he's great, <laughs> even if he forgets his words, you know, but no, we uh, we had a we had, you know, people talk about chemistry. I don't know. You, you, you want two leads that complement each other. And Jonathan and I are so different. You know, in the way that we look, we're we're just different guys. We're different ages. We, you know, we 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 just we just have a very different quality on film, and and I think that um, it made us interesting together. And then we were also able to play off each other and find wish this wouldn't be dinging, and find uh, and find ways to find the humor in the scenes. Well, the two of you are are, are magic together. Um, Holt, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to do this with me. Uh, I'm a great admirer of your work. And, uh, and when you and I got to meet each other at the boxing match and uh, uh, I got to see you, I, I understood why all my boxing friends that know you uh, speak so highly of you. Well, it's nice of you to say it, Al. You know, uh, I look forward to seeing you at the future fights. This was a great experience. So, you know, have a, have a great day. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. So I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Holt as much as I did. Uh, it was just a, a grand experience. Now, next week, uh, we're going to have Tom Yankello on, who is a, uh, a boxing trainer who is very well known within the sport as a really, really good teacher of the sport, teaching people on all levels. And he's currently working with Roy Jones Jr., 
uh, as he gets ready for his uh, fight fight exhibition, we're not sure what it is, with Mike Tyson that's coming up. So, um, so Tripp, we're going to discuss that a little bit with him. It should be interesting. What weight do you think Roy is going to go into the ring at? Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, well, we're going to ask Tom about that for sure. I'm going to say uh, around 200 or something. I'm going to guess yeah. at that, 190-something. Probably. So he's going to be he's going to be bulking up a little bit. A little bit, yeah. I think I think a little bit. And then of course we don't know. The interesting thing is we don't know the nature of this match. Is it is it a half exhibition, half for real? Is it all for real? Is it a hybrid of some kind? We we really don't know that. So we're gonna we're gonna find that out. I know one thing that I have kept you from your honeymoon long enough. So I need you to go back and have fun and enjoy yourself. I will do that gladly. Thanks, Al. All right. Thanks to Tripp for his work. Thanks to Lee for his fine work producing this podcast. And uh, we will see you next time. Winning season returns at my bookie. Winning season means doubling your first deposit. Winning season means insane prop bets, epic bonuses, and the craziest cross-sport wagers. At my bookie, winning season means watching live sports and betting live sports all season long. Rejoice, the NFL has returned. That means action-packed Sundays and huge cash prizes. Get in on the action. Use promo code Bernstein and double your first deposit. New players get up to $1,000 in free play, designed to add more excitement to the sports you love and the games you bet. Bet with the best this NFL season for your chance to win big. Use promo code Bernstein. That's promo code Bernstein, B-E-R-N-S-T-E-I-N, and double your first deposit. Your winning season begins today, only at my bookie.